the secrets of any successful Christian work. Turn to Genesis 41 with me. And let's read. I'll tell Brother Darrell I'm going back to the eye doctor. And uh, we're going to get some bifocals, Darrell. So that order will be coming in a few days. It's getting so bad that I can't see anything but a blur out here, and I love to see you, Martha. And uh, But when it's close up, I need a different deal. I can't... So, so I'm in a fix, you know. So in a few days, maybe we'll be all straightened out. You won't worry so much about me. Remains to be seen whether I can keep bifocals on, but we'll see. <laughs> 41, 41st chapter. Oh, I've had a great time. I have had a great time reading out of Genesis today and reading the life of Jacob um, and um, Rachel. I've had a great time. I've wept today. And um, perhaps this sharing first started while I was um, convalescing and um, read on May the 30th this uh, devotional out of Reaching Toward the Heights, I believe it is, yes, Richard Wormbrand. That's where it came from. And he referred to this 41st chapter. But this, of course, is when Joseph, out of the love of Rachel and Jacob, Joseph came. And, of course, he was sold went into Egypt, and finally arrived second unto Pharaoh. And that whole story is so great. I'm like Chase. Chase was reading about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the other night, how Jesus got in there with them. The angel of the Lord was in there, and how the flames leaped out and consumed those that threw them in, but they didn't have the hair on their head singed. Chase was reading that to his mother. He was saying to me on the phone, Pastor, if we could just get that, if we could have that kind of faith, well, it's available for us. It's available unto us, the same as it was for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the, desire, the thing that thrilled me was that he could see the importance of the story and the importance of, of uh, and that is, he could uh, not let his heart be hardened because it was told to us when we were little and can almost become like a fairy tale. But it's a true story, just as if Pam were taken and taken to, say, some foreign country behind the iron or bamboo curtain and thrown into hostile prisons. And they sought to destroy her, but Jesus appeared beside her. And we told the story of it happening, just like it was her. It's the way it happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which are not their Hebrew names. They're their pagan names, but I forget their, I used to know their Hebrew names. I'll learn them again. 41, reading beginning with, um, oh, about the 46th verse. Maybe we better read verse 37. Let's just get a little bigger, more context here. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh. This was after the dream had been interpreted to him. And in the eyes of all his servants, and Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, according unto thy word, shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had and they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name, huh? Zavnath Paeanian, and he gave him to wife Azanath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. 
And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities and the food of the field which was round about every city laid up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering it for it was out number. He gathered so much, gathered so much till they lost count of it. They had to gather a lot, seven years, so that in seven years there would be a plenty not only for Egypt but a plenty for everybody that would journey because there was famine on all the earth. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Azanath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said, He hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Manasseh, forget. And the name of the second called him he Ephraim, or fruitfulness. For God had caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And the seven years of plenteous, plenteousness was in the land of Egypt were ended, and the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread, and Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because that the famine was so sore in all the lands. Text under the title, The Secrets of Any Successful Christian Work is Genesis, and this one I picked differently from this reading that Pastor Wormbrand gave, but Genesis 41, 54, where it says, But in all the land of Egypt there was bread. Remember? And the seven years of dearth began to come according to Joseph said, And the dearth was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. Pastor Wormbrand has written his daily devotional, reading, Reaching Toward the Heights, for May 30th, and says that there are three reasons why Egypt had plenty when famine covered the entire earth for seven years. Furthermore, he says, these three reasons are the secrets of any successful Christian work. Amazingly, these three reasons are qualities are attributable not to Joseph, as one would first suspect, but rather to Pharaoh himself. In other words, in the personality of Pharaoh, how he was, characteristics of Pharaoh, we discover three reasons for why not only Egypt had bread and was successful in this time, but we discover three secrets of any successful Christian work. Quite frankly, as I read through these passages, Pharaoh was a very admirable person. And according to Pastor Wormbrand, he in his personality held not only the secrets of national leadership, but the secrets to any successful Christian work. These secrets number three. I'm going to pick up Pastor's book now and read from that for I feel like the impact would be much greater because of listing three things that Pastor Wormbrand has said. First of all, he says that Pharaoh was 
of that time, the Pharaoh of that time, this Pharaoh over Joseph, was every inch a king. Every inch a king. He acted as a king not only when awake, but his subconscious was also filled with concern for the welfare of his people. And he would dream about it at night. He acted every inch a king. Every Christian is a king. And Luther said, every Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. But, Luther also says, a Christian is a dutiful servant of all, subject to all. So you see the link. Pharaoh was a king, subject to none. So is every Christian. But Pharaoh was truly a king, even in his subconscious. So he dreamed at night about how to take care of his people. And God honored his dreaming. God honored his desire. God honored his hope. God honored his hopeful plans. Though he may, may have only heard them in whispers. And gave him a dream of substance, a dream from heaven. He didn't know what it said, nor could he find an interpreter. But God gave the dream. You remember how the fat cows came up in the dream, and then later there were seven lean cows, and the fat cows desired or devoured the lean cows. Then there were, I think, seven sheaves of wheat or of grain. They were fat. Then there were, I came on the scene, seven that were, were very thin and blown and lean, and the seven devoured the lean. He called his magicians in. What does this mean? He knew it was a dream from God, but he couldn't interpret it. What does this mean? The cupbearer, or the butler, remembered then, had forgotten Joseph all those years, and remembered there was one who could interpret dreams, and he knew that it was true interpretation because the cupbearer had been restored to Pharaoh, whereas the butler had been killed in three days. He interpreted both of their dreams. It happened just like Joseph said. Joseph t said to the cupbearer, remember me. But he didn't remember him until Pharaoh had his dream. And Joseph gave the interpretation that it's going to be seven years of plenty. And I read to you how amazed Pharaoh was and said, my, is there such a man as this in whom there's the Spirit of God? Joseph said to him, now what you want to do is get ready, take a fifth from all the collect from all the farmers and all, all of the substance of the land, a fifth of everything for seven years. And um, find someone to administrate this. Someone with wisdom. Someone with discernment. Why, Pharaoh said, I hear the man. And his advisor said, this is true. He's the man. But Pharaoh was a king. And he was a fellow who thought like a king. He thought about the welfare of the people. Luther says a Christian is a dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Now, do you remember my sermon Sunday? Do you remember that I said, and I thought we would just connect this in. I said that James and John had asked for a place of prominence with Christ... They asked for their calling to be fulfilled with specificity. And he could not determine the specifics. I do note that he did not rebuke them, however. It was a worthy desire to have their calling fulfilled. But he said something to them, or something to all of us and to them and all the disciples, that would indicate that their emphasis was in the wrong place. And that's what I brought to you Sunday. If you're really going to be a king, if you're really going to be a leader, be a king all the way. And get your priorities straight. 
If you're really going to be called to be a leader, find out where your priorities should be. And he said this to the disciples who had asked for the most prominent place, the right and left. But Jesus called them and and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And in a few moments, the two blind men were hollering, Thou Son of David, have mercy upon us. And he demonstrated his message. Because his calling was in Jerusalem to die and give his blood for us. But his emphasis, even at that moment, wasn't upon his calling, was upon the outworking, upon his ministry, upon service. God would take care of the calling. His ministry was upon service. Now, a true king is one that loses his life for his people. I am amazed that Jesus said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercised dominion over them, meaning the countries round about in that day. But had he referred back to Egypt at that time, he would have had to say, it is different with Pharaoh. Pharaoh does not live like a heathen prince. Pharaoh lives like a Christian prince. Whether there's not one black mark on him at all. The man to be admired here, in addition to Joseph, is Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He was a true king. And his priorities were in the right place. He was servant of all. He dreamed and slept the welfare of his people. God saw the honesty of his heart and saw the love of the people. And a long time before, used the negativeness of his brothers to get him into a pit, to sell him to the Ishmaelites or Midianites, to get him sold to Potiphar, who then threw him in jail over false charges. And then, after he interpreted the dreams some time before, brought him to the right hand of Pharaoh, second in the nation of Egypt, second in command in the world, if you please. Pharaoh is to be admired. He was not as a heathen prince. He was as a Christian prince. Jesus is a light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And Jesus had lighted the conscience of Pharaoh. That may be hard on your Christian doctrine, but let her be hard, brother. Let her be hard. What I know about Wormbrand is he suffered enough to be not dogmatic and not um, doctrinaire. Brother, he suffered long enough to see there's something bigger than a Pharisee with doctrine. So he says, admire Pharaoh. Say he was never inch a king. If you're going to be a Christian, recognize your kingship and really be a king. So much so that the welfare, the welfare of your brethren is as much thought of as your own. Let each esteem others more highly than himself, Paul says. It's great. I marvel at it that he, that he had a Christian conscience insofar as the light of Christ had shone upon him. Well... Secondly, first reason of success, he said in all Christian work, Wormbrand said, is that we would be every inch a king. And in being every inch a king, we're subject to all. That is, we're a servant to all and subject to all as well as being liberated from all. I'll pick Wormbrand's book back up for emphasis. Pharaoh... The dreamer of good meets another dreamer of dreams, Joseph, and is united with him. Wormbrand says, do the same. Do the same. Pharaoh was a dreamer of good. 
And he meets another dreamer of dreams, Joseph, and he's united with him. You do the same. That's what Wormbrand said. We're talking about the secrets of any successful Christian work. Now for those of us who seem to be a little hung up on dreaming dreams, I want to unhang you. I'm disturbed that any of you would ever be hung up over it. Because that's the difference between us and animals. The difference between an animal and a human being is that a human being can dream dreams. That is, he has reason and thought and can plan ahead and think higher than his existence. He can acclimate to more than it's in his atmosphere. That's the difference in our humanity. It has to do with God putting an eternal nature in us. Making him like himself. The thing that makes us like God is that we can dream. We have an imagination. Now, there's, there's different type of dreams. I was working. I'm not a Hebrew. Oh, I really got to have help. I want to take Hebrew as fast as I can. But I, in the uh, transliterations, I was working with, with uh, Hazan or Halam and also the other word. I can't remember it now. I was working with them tonight the best I could. There, and I see that there is a dream, a course, given of God. I can see that. A dream or a vision. And there's false dreams and there are good dreams. There are dreams that are not of God and dreams that are of God. And there's the dreaming process. That's a very healthy part of our psychological existence. We didn't dream at night. According to what we know now, we'd be in a lot of trouble by morning time. Every man dreams whether he knows it or not. They can stick electric things to your head. They'll find you have a period of dreaming. There's a time of dreaming. And it's a psychological release or something that goes on that we know very little about it. All men dream, whether they know it or not. But the kind of dreaming that I'm speaking of, that Pharaoh was first before God ever gave him a dream from heaven, is the one that I feel that often I feel some drawback on. And that is the dream that comes out of our own needs. The dreaming that comes out of our own needs. God made you, made me as creatures who need belongingness and creatures who need fulfillment and creatures who need have certain needs. And out of those needs, there comes a dream that they might be met. The dream of love. And if God is going to make us like that so that these desires are in there, why shouldn't we dream of their fulfillment? By the way, you may not accept this, but the leading psychiatrists and psychologists tell us that prestige is a dream. That is esteem, uh, not a dream, but a need, and it must be filled. A man must have acceptance, and there must be a measure of prestige in his existence. It's very hard for any man to be an island. And one of the great poets said that no man is an island. All of us are connected with each other. Now, I'm not, I want to differentiate between the dream that God gives or the dream and the vision of things we see, that kind of thing, or even the dreaming here. I want to differentiate between that and something I read in Psalm 37, which speaks of dream or desire. That's why I noticed these words on hope, dream, and desire. The the kind of put down I feel among us sometimes is that which is very legitimate. The desire, the dream of fulfillment. The, 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 The witness of the Holy Spirit or the vision of God comes later. All right, I'll show you where it says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the dreams of thy heart, the desires of thy heart. The, the Hebrew word there is the askings, the petitions. We don't know whether God's in it or not, but we have certain needs, and we have a dream of fulfillment. We have an asking of fulfillment. Now, if you put it down, how are you going to get it? You're not going to get it. Because James 4.2 says you don't have it because you don't dream of it. You don't ask it because you don't ask for it. 
But that's, that's not as solid as anything can be. I don't know what is. You haven't got it because you won't dream of it. You haven't got it because you don't ask for it. Brother, you're walking no higher than what you're asking for. You're walking no higher than what you're dreaming for. The whole world's been changed by men who've had a desire in their heart to see something different for themselves and for others. If they hadn't have done it, they never would have been granted to them. He said, James said, you don't have it because you don't dream of it. But what's better than that is in Ephesians we find in 3.20, but he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or dream according to the power that work within us. The kingdom of God is liberated. Think of it. But you're not going to get it, brother, if you're, if you're less than a dreamer. Even the communist dream of utopia doing everything within their power to bring into effect how much better it is for a Christian man to dream of better things that God may see his desires and grant them. Perhaps we're too specific with our dreams sometime, but our dreams are still worthwhile. And then God says, <clears throat> sends a dream. But if you have a dreamer, he needs to meet another dreamer. And they need to get together. Because the Bible says, if any two of you dream together, they shall dream what they will. Yeah. See, the basic work is ask or petition. See, I was having a time with this in my study today. Let them dream what they will. And my heavenly Father will grant it unto them. For where two or three are dreaming together, there am I in the midst of them. Brother, we're dreaming of a better life for ourselves. We're dreaming of a better life for our church here. Pharaoh was a dreamer. He dreamed of the welfare of his people. God sent him a specific answer as to how his people would be taken care of, even above what he had thought of why he didn't know famine was coming. And so God, this man who was every inch, in a, every inch a king, asked for his people, and God sent him Joseph and started the process a long time ago because he was more Christian than he was pagan in personality. He responded to the light of conscience, a great man who has not one negative mark upon him at all. Inasmuch as he received Joseph and received Joseph's God. As far as the light of Scripture is concerned, where do you think he lands up? Well, I won't go any further with it because I might have some argument. But uh, <clears throat> you might have to shake hands with Pharaoh when you get into heaven. Whether you want to or not. The Savior, it was the Savior who said, if you receive my servant, you receive me. Jesus said that. And oh, dear Lord, how wonderful it is for one dreamer to find another dreamer and get united. And then God said, I'll grant it. I'll grant it. If two of you shall dream together, I'll grant it. This is great. See, now, that wasn't in Wormbrand's sharing, but that's in my sharing. See, something. See, David, I got to going back there and find those Hebrew words. I said, I got to help my people. There's a rumor going around that it's not so good to dream. Don't you believe it, brother? It's the difference between of the, of being an animal and a human being. It's in the very likeness and nature of God. And you can't even get on higher ground until you start dreaming. Ah, that did me so much good a while ago. I said, dear Lord. And that's the very one the Holy Spirit witnessed on my brother said, that touches me, the second verse. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim, my dream is higher ground. Bring me some water there. Oh, dear God, get off the doubt and territory. Get off the grit and grind of this earth and see what God wants to accomplish. That's why we're praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Don't say I'm a realist. I'm an earthly. No, you're a creature of the kingdom. We don't want what earth's got to order. We want heaven to come on earth. And we're praying for it, and it will. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth one of these days. 
And a whole lot of it can fall on us now if we won't be so hard-hearted because our attitudes are stopping what God wants us to have. Because we won't dream and ask and desire and link up with someone else who has dreams and who desire. You know, it's a, Jesus helping insofar as this subject is in its beginning. I got in on that years ago. I found out there weren't many people dreaming about walking with a man who walked like the men of the Old and New Testament. But I dreamed it anyway. I had every reason to be discouraged. I had every reason to, to give up. I didn't do it. I dreamed on anyway. And if they told me, if anybody said to me, what you're dreaming of is impossible. I remember Daddy singing when I was a boy. If I'm dreaming, let me dream on. If I'm dreaming, let me dream on. If that's all it is, let me dream on. But Kant so wonderfully said, one of the greatest philosophers, and still it's accepted today, Kant said that if it's imaginable, it exists somewhere. The very oughtness of anything means there's a God somewhere. And the philosophers can't argue with that. Universally, it's accepted. Oh, I'm so thrilled with what the Lord showed me today. While I was studying this, I'm so glad that I read this May 30th uh, thing of Pastor Wormbrands. Now, number three. I, I was thinking, Rodney, I was thinking about your coming. I don't know what dreams were in your soul, but the Lord surely has delivered. He surely is delivering. I think you told me that God had delivered given unto you most all the desires of your heart and it satisfied your soul you were praying we need more than bread we need more than earth there's a greater dream in our soul we've got to ask for it he asked for it he prayed he agonized over it and God brought to him what he needed most and it's still coming to pass and as far as the welfare of the church is concerned by the way I didn't read something you said a Christian does not strive to be a soul winner this is under the king, every inch a king. It is no imposition to him to place the well-being of the church first. His Christian belief has pervaded his subconscious. Remember it said, king of my conscience. Did you get that? See, that's why I said, oh, remember that. See, the Holy Spirit was leading, and I, I wanted you to pay attention to that. Kindle every high desire. Perish self in thy pure fire. Then the last verse said, Holy Spirit, right divine, keen within my conscience reign. Be my law and I shall be firmly bound forever free. That's why I could see God was working in, in these hymns that Rodney was praying over rather quickly there. Then when we got to that second verse, my heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay, though some may dwell where these abound. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. I sought for a church that had a higher vision than nominal Christianity, and they almost killed me in saying it's not possible. I sought for someone who walked with God, and they said, there is no man. I said, I'll dream on. In essence, I wasn't ugly with them, but in my heart, my response was the same. I'll dream on anyway. I, I sought for a church where they would pay the pastors what God wanted them to pay, and they said, it'll never be done. I said, I'll dream on. I sought for a place where men and women would put the kingdom of God first and where more light that's shed upon the church world today would be, and they said, it can't be. I said, I'll dream on. I'll dream on anyway. And over the telephone one day, the Holy Spirit said, the sixth church you have on your list is where the plan, and the promise, and the purposes are. That's where it's going to take place. And I said, thank you, Jesus. And I came by faith. Because I wanted, to, I wanted to get on some higher ground. Get on some higher ground for my own soul and get on some higher ground with some people. And so a man like Brother Chitty arrives and said, this is like a dream. I've only dreamed in being in such a place. Never thought it would happen on the face of the earth. See, the reason you can't respond to that 
several of us is because we really don't know what we have. We don't know what God has given us. But Chuck broke down on the phone the other night and said he wished all of you had the, had the privilege of being taken away for six weeks or six months. Then he said you would understand why he was breaking and crying on the phone. Though God's got him down there as a missionary. And God's helped him give him a wonderful time. Yet he was breaking because he knew that here was a place where God had ordained that we join together and dream. And see our dreams fulfilled. And Ephraim comes and a little Indian servant and missions are spread abroad and now flourishing and proliferating in at least one foreign country that we know about in Nigeria. It's a dream. But we joined with a dreamer. Wormbrand says that Pharaoh, the dreamer of good. Now, did you get that? Before he ever got his dream from God, there was the ask which was the desire of the heart, remember? The desire of the heart, the prayer of the heart, that our needs can be fulfilled. The only trouble you and I get into is when we get our attitudes or try to take our life in our own hands, and instead of losing our life to gain all, we try to save our life, and we lose it all. And the world saying, save your life. Save your life through position. Save your life through power. Save your life through education. It's saying just the opposite of that which Jesus said. Jesus said, lose it all. And he said, and I'll give you all. This is great, isn't it? All right. Now the last one. Well, I don't, I don't know that it's the best, but it's awfully good. I, again, take up Pastor Wimbrand's book. Now, here's a man who should have stopped dreaming in 13 years. Here's a man who ought to be bitter. Here's a man who ought to be cynical, uh, speaking from the voice of the earth. Here's a man whose feet still hurt. Here's a man whose life is still threatened. But here's a man who dreams greater today than when, than ever, and dreamed and dreamed on while he was in communist prisons in room number four, out of which no man but him, as far as he know, has ever come out. He says the third thing that he sees about Pharaoh was that Pharaoh was completely unprejudiced. He was advised, now Christians, it's going to help us. I was talking about fundamentalism a while ago. Fundamentalism, our fundamental people, conservative people, ought to be the very best. They ought to be the most like Jesus because Jesus was fundamental. He believed that the Word of God was the Word of God. He believed that, that uh, by the way, he believed in his virgin birth. <laughs> he believed that he had the blood of God within him. He came to shed his blood for us. He believed all this. He was very fundamental. But he was not narrow in his thinking. Keep in mind that I am conservative and fundamental. And I believe that it's the correct doctrinal way. I believe that, that the... Uh, Word of God is the true Word of God from cover to cover and in its autographs without error. I believe this. believe this with all my heart. And Jesus did too. But oh, to find a man with a spirit like this. Now, Pharaoh was completely unprejudiced. He was advised to call to his court a foreigner with another color of skin. A man with what must have seemed to Pharaoh a strange religion. A man who worshipped only one unseen God. A prisoner with a bad reputation. Shall I read it again? Now you think of Pharaoh and how in prejudice he was. He was advised to call to his court a foreigner with another color of skin. A man with what must have seemed to Pharaoh a strange religion. A man who worshipped only one unseen God a prisoner with a bad reputation and the charge for which he had been jailed was an assault on a woman with the intent to commit rape. He knew all this about Joseph. Different color of skin. A man with a strange religion. A man who believed in only one God. Why, from Pharaoh's point of view, anybody could tell that polytheism was the correct way. 
I mean, he had enough subjective experience at least to empirically start a philosophy of polytheism, he felt. He probably interpreted the the movement of demons and the witchery of the sorcery of the witchcraft as uh, different gods, you see. So empirically, he, he could have established a case for polytheism, meaning the worship of many gods, but this man believed only in one god. The Lord, our God, is one God. Hmm. Wormbrand writes about this, but to Pharaoh, every man was first of all a man. Every man could be used for the welfare of the country. Men who committed bad deeds yesterday could become good men this morning. And besides, who knew if the charges against Joseph were true? Slaveholders like Potiphar often jailed their slaves without fair trial. I'm prejudiced. Oh, my. I'm prejudiced. I'm prejudiced. Christians... How wonderful it would be if we were as unprejudiced as Pharaoh. He jumped to many a hurdle to get through to quality. And in spite of all the charges by the different color, in in spite of the religion that seemed so foreign, in spite of the fact that this man was, was, was charged with rape, intent to rape, assault with intent to rape, He found something else in his spirit. See, he had a a witness of honesty that the Spirit of God filled this man and knew that the charges were wrong. And because he was unprejudiced, see, God brought his dream to pass. God brought his dream in two ways. His dream of asking and his dream of promise. They're two different things. I said don't put down either. Especially the first. If you do, you won't get it. Secondly, if God makes the promise, he's the fulfiller. If it's a conditional promise, you don't want to doubt it. If it's an unconditional promise, it's going to happen anyway. God told Pharaoh that this was going to happen. It was an unconditional promise. But here is how you can take care of your first dream. They're asking for your people. I'm going to put a dreamer with you. And if you unite, you unite with him, I'll take care of your asking, of your dreaming. But how did he ever get to that? How could he unite with a dreamer unless he was unprejudiced? Oh, it's great. Pharaoh, I wish Stephen were here to holler. Because... There's so many prejudices in our minds. Thank God for what we're liberated from, from but we need, we need liberation all the way. God's helped us, hasn't he? Amen. Isn't it wonderful to find out that Catholics can get as saved as Protestants and non-denominational people can be as saved as Protestants or Catholics? Isn't it wonderful to find out? Isn't it wonderful to find out that, that a person may have an, uh, doctrines that are atrocious, at least from our point of view or from their point of view, and yet God sees the honesty of their heart and hears the cry of their... Isn't that wonderful to find that out? Isn't it wonderful to know that a man like Socrates could be spoken of of God? I can't explain all this. But when Jesus comes into the light of conscience, that's all Socrates had. But God told him that he was a white. Steve said when I first told that story, it was something he couldn't hardly swallow. He just couldn't hardly swallow it. He didn't tell me about it, but it was so hard on him doctrinally. I'll tell you what was harder on him was when he found out that I had a great love and a great appreciation and a subordination to the great Calvinist preachers of yesterday and today. And then he found out what they believed. He about had a conception. He and Dave, uh, they didn't get into a fight. There was no hostility. But he, he about had his finger up and said, David, do you believe this? He was saying, you know how Stephen is? David, how in the world can you believe this? And then he saw something else. 
How in the world could Oliver have loved these men who teach, in some points, totally the opposite of what he teaches? Oliver preaches that a man can backslide and be lost, or at least he thought I preached that and believed that. I'm not arguing the point because I need security. Boy, if I listen to a Wesleyan too long, he'll put me in hell before I've got half a chance. And so I've got to get over on the other side of the fence, find out somebody who tells me that Christ can get me through and that I can't be plucked out of the Father's hand. That my hungry heart, that, the, that is true where it says, Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And that God's going according to my hunger, not to my performance. Now I know, see, well, I, uh, Wesley and say, well, where's the obedience? Well, obedience has got to be there, and as a habit of life, it's got to be there. And if a man's truly saved, it's there. But boy, perfect obedience. You show me the man that's perfectly obedient. I don't know but one man that's broke, not broken step with God since he's been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Where he's obeyed God and everything that God said, known him to do. I don't know but one man that way. Think of that. It will only be by God's grace that he can ever make it to the trumpet call. Obeying God, but never broken stride with God. It's wonderful, isn't it? Unprejudiced. I'm thinking of this. One thing that has dumped our prejudices is the witness of the Holy Spirit. Because God is not prejudiced. The Holy Spirit says, this man knows me. In Egypt or Austria or whatever... The man at the tomb, you remember, right before we got to the tomb, who cried out and said, this is the man of God, an Arab evangelist who told me wonderful and beautiful things so sacred that I have not uttered them hardly to anyone, especially what Helen wrote down one day and still has it written, things that he said, because men wouldn't believe if I told them what he said. But the Holy Spirit spoke through him about some things to come. So beautiful and so wonderful, but unprejudiced. Unprejudiced against folks who are down the street, whether they be Church of Christ or Presbyterian. Unprejudiced, even if they be prejudiced against us. Because one of our great callings is not to discriminate against those who discriminate. It's a lonely trail. Most everybody wants you to hook up with somebody and get on some ideological road. When the Word of God is open to every man. By the way, Lone, it comes to me. When you said that we've got to live by more than bread, they wouldn't even have had bread if it had not been for the spiritual satisfaction. See, if it had not been for the Word of God, and the only way it got through there was the light of God was in on Pharaoh's soul. He was responding to the light of Christ. And because of that, he was able to get through to Joseph. But you see, it was the Word of God that brought the literal bread. You know what I'm thinking before I bring the conclusion? How much will this kind of thing, these two principles, help us in famine to come? And I didn't build this message around that. How much will these principles help us with troubled times that are coming? Huh? A dreamer? Uniting with a dreamer and someone who is not bigoted or prejudiced seems to me that it's a successful way to get fed during the time of famine as I think about it now. Pharaoh was completely unprejudiced. And now may I close with the words of Wormbrand and then may I put my own words in. The fulfilling of these conditions gave Egypt great plenty and provision for themselves and their neighbors in times of famine. Wormbrand says, these qualities will make you a winner also. All right, I'll rephrase it. The fulfilling of these conditions will give Scott Depot Christ Fellowship great plenty and provision for themselves and their neighbors in times of famine. The secrets of any successful Christian work. 
Well, I'm so glad Brother Don Schwartner is with us tonight because I have a feeling that he knew most of this before he was ever converted. I have a feeling that he was principled in these three before he was ever converted. I just thought of that when I was getting rid of the maids. I said, when I met Don and looked into his eyes, I saw that he had three, all three of these qualities already. All he was looking for was another dreamer. And a dreamer has love in his eyes. A dreamer has love in his eyes. Did you get that? And when I saw him, I saw that there were eyes filled with love. I saw I had a friend. I didn't even know that he hadn't come to a profession of Christianity. But I knew that I saw in his... See, as I look back on it, I saw in him what you can see in Pharaoh. And I went right to him and loved him. And that experience proved to him that God was the author of reality. Love was the great prover. And so he just walked into the kingdom. And he's here with us tonight. Oh, this is great. A while ago when Kathy said what she did, Pastor Kathy said what she did. She said, well, thank you for what a pastor has already shared with us. I want you to know the Holy Ghost witnessed to my heart. that The Holy Spirit was saying, be thankful for what I've already shared. And I probably have had more to fight this night than in all of Sunday put together. Yeah, but the Holy Spirit said, be thankful for what I've shared. And I said, Jesus, I can tell. I can tell by what I'm racing through and what I'm opposing here. I can tell that I'm more of thee than I thought I was. Yeah, I can tell it. Because I've really gotten down to the roots of men's thinking and men's attitudes. I've really gotten down there. Here's, now here's why that Stephen, here's another reason why Stephen said the pastor's going to need a lot of help. The Holy Ghost said he's going to need a lot of help. Because I have, see, see when I first met Brother Ham, it, if I hadn't loved him and knew that God was directing his life, he upset me so many times. I don't mean I was upset at him, but I was upset enough to get upset at him if I wasn't careful not to be upset at what I was upset over. In other words, it flustered my existence. I couldn't understand. I'd be with him and say, Jesus, you say pray. He stopped and pray. There's an earthquake. Oh, God, still quiet, eliminate, squelch. Well, I, I, we prayed about for 25 earthquakes, and I said, Jesus, there's not 25 earthquakes going on I know anything about. But I said, maybe there is. That was the end of that year. U.S. News and World Report came out and said there was over 3,000 earthquakes recorded on it, just recorded on the grass that year. I said, oh, Lord. I heard him pray for 25. But see, man, the man of spirit goes by what the spirit tells him. But I never heard a man praying that way. And then I thought, how in the world can he pray and it stop those things? And then Jesus showed me one day, while Jesus was walking primarily as the son of man, he just got up on a boat and said, quiet, be quiet, be still. Whew, got still. And us being the body of Christ, he wants us to, he works through our prayers. He wants us praying. He wants to rule the world through grace and truth. He wants them stopped. He wants us to come against these storms. He wants us to work at this and pray for it. Oh, I said, but you see, what upset me, I didn't get upset about. Therefore, my attitude never got against him. But a man of the Spirit will upset people. But if they won't get upset what they're upset about, then they won't get upset at him. What does it mean? It means in spite of the ruffling of the feathers and the knocking down and the barriers of prejudice, if they'll still love him, God will show him. I, I have not upset men with my faults and mistakes only a few times in this life, but most always when God speaks through me. Most always, I'd say 95 to 99 percent of the time, when God speaks through me, I upset people. This is so wonderful tonight. I'm glad I got to share it with you. I like the name of his book, don't you? Reaching Toward the Heights. I 
Wormbrand can do it, we can too. The devil tells me, of course, and probably told some of you, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to live long enough to see my dreams fulfilled. Well, I don't believe him. If by some chance God would zap me out of here, you talk about a fulfillment. <laughs> But I believe that the reason we're working so hard to keep my health in balance, and thank you, Scott Depot, I was warned years ago what to do, and I thought that the rules would change, but they really never changed. And so now I know I'm just going to have to live with them the rest of my life, and thereby God may have mercy one day and turn on me and really heal me completely if I'll do what Jesus says. He may just turn around and say, now, son, here, just be well. Be like a young man inside. I'm like, I think I'm fairly young outside, but be like a young man inside. So I'm not worrying about it. I, I believe what Jesus told me. And I have dreamed, I've kept on dreaming in spite of the fact that in recent days, my life only hung by a thread. That tells you more about what kind of a state I was in. And that, for reasons of a very tired and old heart, I can't resume normal pastoral work. But isn't it wonderful that the Lord said, I'll help you preach, sometimes three times a week. Yeah, I'll help you preach. I'll give you power in the pulpit. And I'll help you travel with some limitations. But that's about all you're going to be able to do. Just pray and wait upon me. Oh, can I tell you something? No, I'm just... Oh, oh, hallelujah. Glory. Jesus brought it to me. What I shared with the choir, this is so great. I just cried over Jacob and Rachel today. Lord, I just... It just tore me all to pieces. I never... I see, I got... Good, the Holy Spirit helped me to get in on their love today. Oh, I just wept over it. I said, this is great. But Rachel wanted a child. See, we don't know much about this because our, our age is very different. But the blessing of God was, was determined by, through the woman by her fruitfulness, the fruitfulness of her womb. And she wanted a child. And she was the one loved of Rachel. And that night of the wedding night here, Rachel was all dressed up and ready to go into Jacob. And her father, because of the rule of that land, removed her and put Leah there, who was not, his, not who he desired. Oh, must have broken Rachel's heart. Because when Jacob came, her dream, she, she, met, she knew him. She knew him down with the watering trough. Jacob knew her. She knew him. She knew that the, the man of God had arrived. The prince had arrived. She knew it. She knew the dream of her heart had arrived. She knew it. And her daddy pulled this shenanigan. Put Leah in there. And of all things, Leah had all these sons, one son right after another, starting with Reuben, just a son. And boys, you talk about having a woman, and you know what? She gave credit to God, not to her pagan father's God. She gave credit to God. Well, how do you think Rachel felt? Oh, it was like she was cursed of God. It was like she was cursed of God. And that went on for ten years. The devil fought her so awfully. But then one day she heard the voice of Jehovah. He said, he said, and God remembered her. Oh, it's so beautiful. God remembered her. He had never forgotten her. It's a manner of speaking in the Mosaic. Right? And God remembered her, opened her womb, and gave Jacob and Rachel Joseph. May he add the increaser. But something happened to Rachel's body. It started down then, and it started down, and it started down, and when Benjamin was born, she died. Why didn't he give her ch children sooner? Because he wanted Rachel in the arms of Jacob. Because Leah could have babies like ewes. Like the sheep. But her constitution wasn't made that way. So he wanted her to wait. 
so she could comfort Jacob. For Jacob, his love for her made 14 years seem but as days. He loved her so much. Oh, Rachel, if you could have only known. If you could only have waited so that you'd brought more comfort to Jacob. Because when Joseph was born, the sickness set in. And when Benjamin was born, she died. And they buried her outside of Bethlehem. Boy, that tomb will never be the same to me again. God knew what her body was like. God knows all the situations and all the circumstances. Our waiting is for a purpose. Our waiting is because we're having something that we can't have when the promise comes. Our waiting, he brings it in at the right time so all things will work together for our good. See, it's all working together for our good. If Rachel had known that, she would have been more contented and Jacob would have had more contentment. What a wonderful day it was when Jacob opened the tent and she said, My beloved, God has spoken. I shall have a child. And her desire had been granted. But it meant only a matter of days, weeks, few years, till she was gone and buried outside of... Say, does that help us a little bit? Yes, I started to close, but I remembered. I remembered what I saw today. I said, oh God... You had her wait for a purpose, for her own benefit and for that of Jacob's. Touches my heart. He had her wait for Jacob. See, it touches my heart now. He said, I I wanted Jacob to have Rachel. He loved her so much, and I knew that her body could never take it. He should go down. He said, well, why didn't God just heal her? God is limited by his own holiness. There are certain forces set up that if you violate them, certain rules set up, see, certain things back in the Constitution, certain things in her genetics, that if you violate them, he can do that. And if it's will, he will do it. But he rarely does that. So what do you do? He works everything after the counsel of his own will. Taking all that into consideration, he brings Joseph and Benjamin at the right time. After Jacob had been satisfied for years, with the love of Rachel. That ought to help us to wait tonight. He's working something out before the dream comes true. We have a tendency to say, well, if you don't bring me Joseph, if you don't bring my dream, if you don't bring me my Joseph, I think I'll just quit dreaming. Look out. You won't have Joseph because you didn't ask for him. But she never got to that point. She kept on asking. We've had a great meeting tonight. We've had a great meeting. I just regret that the Reinhardts are gone and couldn't have heard how God has helped us in this place. What? Oh, he would just... He just... We'd have just talked and talked and talked. It helped me. See, because on vital points here tonight... When I really needed help and perhaps some were offended, oh, he would, he would have heard him say, oh, that touches my heart, Oliver. Pastor, God's witnessing to me here while you're talking. That's what would have gone on, see. So I'll have to labor till he gets back. It's great to have the sight, but I have to walk by faith that I submitted myself to God and he's brought us this precious message. Let's stand together.